Every year, uh, when we finish the Easter season with the Feast of Pentecost, there are a series of Sundays that follow. The first one is always the, the Holy Trinity, and the second is always the Body and Blood of Christ, Corpus Christi. Uh, it's always the same, although this feast has three uh, sets of readings, the A, B, C, and cycle. Um, so today, there's, there, there's some common things in the readings. They all speak about blessing and giving thanks to God. And in the first reading, uh, Abraham, uh, really by God's help, has defeated the armies and brought his people back. And uh, so he gives thanks to God, and, and Melchizedek blesses him, and then he gives one-tenth of all of his booty back to God because he is so grateful. And that is, in fact, and it's mentioned in the Prayer of the Faithful today, that is the thinking behind the, the giving one-tenth to God based on gratitude. The second reading, Jesus gives thanks as he blesses and breaks the bread and distributes it to them. And at the Last Supper, he uh, celebrates in thanksgiving to God. And he tells them, his disciples, whenever you do this, do this in memory of me. Talks about forgiveness sin. But then he also adds this, he says, and every time you do this, you're going to be doing something incredible. You'll be proclaiming the death of the Lord until he comes again. And then finally in the gospel, we have the familiar multiplication of the fish and loaves. And, and there's so many things in this story. For one thing, uh, there's this incredible number of people. And the disciples urge Jesus to send them home because there's no food. And he says, well, why don't you feed them? And they said, well, we couldn't do it. We, we'd have to go buy it. And basically they threw their hands up. And he says, well, what have you got? And he says, well, we've only got two fish and five loaves. And what good is that? So Jesus gives thanks blesses it, and distributes it. And lo and behold, everybody eats. In fact, they eat and they're full, completely satisfied. And as if that's not enough, there are leftovers, 12 baskets. And by the way, if you think 12 is an accident, this is very carefully planned. There were 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles. 12 is one of those magic numbers. And it's suggesting plenitude. It's suggesting Everybody's satisfied, and there's a lot left over because this is new Israel, and God takes care of everything. Great story. But I don't want to talk about any of that today. What I want to talk about is this. And this is inspiration. I don't know where this came from. I was taking my walk about three days ago, and this song came into my head, and I thought, oh my God, what is this? Um, it made me think about people who like to celebrate... Uh, for any reason. So they'll throw a party, uh, like, like I throw one every year with some friends, or we rotate. It's a fatherless Father's Day, because everybody in this group, uh, we've lost our fathers over the years. So when we come, we come specifically to remember our fathers who have died and their impact in our lives. A fatherless Father's Day, we call it. Well, some people like to celebrate Christmas in July. I've never done it, but I might do it this year. Christmas in July, why? Well, uh, I like Christmas, but I think they just like throwing parties. So I was thinking of this, and this song popped in my mind. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth, my two front teeth, my two front teeth. All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth so I can with you Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it's sad, isn't it, huh? Merry Christmas. I like this song. It's a silly song, but... I like it because of the sentiments in it. First of all, uh, this kid, he's praying to God or Santa or somebody, somebody hear me, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth, my two front teeth, my two front teeth. All I want is my two front teeth. And he's begging and pleading. I don't want to buy I don't want skates, I don't want this, I just want my two front teeth. But he says, why? He says, because... I can't say Merry Christmas to you. I can only say Merry Christmas. And I want to say Merry Christmas to you. Great song. So, think about it. And it led me to another song that really has become one of my favorites this year. I, I really, really love this song. And I'm going to read it. And I'm going to read the refrain every single time because um, this is just too powerful to me. And it, it really speaks to me about the meaning of Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ. I think it's called, There's a Longing. It's there's a 
longing in our hearts, O oh Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us. Now, this is a great phrase because I think Thomas Aquinas wrote one of the songs and speaks about how the Eucharist, that piece of bread, both reveals Jesus Christ and hides Jesus Christ. It hides Jesus Christ in the sense that we look at it and what we see is bread. But it reveals Jesus Christ because it's a biblical fulfillment of he is the bread of life that has come to feed and nourish us. So the Eucharist is both revealing and hiding at the same time. There is a longing in our hearts, O oh Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us, and he does so in Eucharist. There is a longing in our hearts for love we only find in you, our God. These are my words. For what? For justice, for freedom, for mercy. Hear our prayer. In sorrow, in grief, be near. Hear our prayer, O oh God. There is a longing in our hearts, O oh Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us. There is a longing in our hearts for love we only find in you, our God. For what? For wisdom, for courage, for comfort, hear our prayer. In weakness, in fear, be near, hear our prayer, O God. There is a longing in our hearts, O Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us. There is a longing in our hearts for love we only find in you, our God. For what? For healing, for wholeness, for new life, hear our prayer. In sickness, in death, be near, hear our prayer, O God. There is a longing in our hearts, O Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us. There is a longing in our hearts for love we only find in you, our God. Lord, save us. Take pity. Light in our darkness. We call you. We wait. Be near. Hear our prayer, O God. There is a longing, a longing in our hearts, O Lord, for you to reveal yourself to us. There is a longing in our hearts for love we only find in you, our God. There is a longing. Beautiful word, to long for something. This little boy is longing for two front teeth so he can wish you Merry Christmas. Just wants two front teeth. What do we long for? What, what do we long for deep, deep in our spirit? You know, we have a bunch of traditions around Eucharist, even if you could say some rules. One of them is we're supposed to fast for an hour. No food or drink for an hour. Well, personally, I think it's ridiculous. It wasn't when it was three hours, because the idea was, some people said, well, Jesus suffered on the cross three hours. Surely you could suffer little and for three hours don't eat or drink anything. I don't think that's the reason. For penance, for discipline, I don't think that's the reason. It may be some to that. But I think the reason was simply practical. If you and I went for three hours without eating or drinking before we came to receive the Lord, what is possibly, possibly one of the things that we might feel? Hunger. Hunger. And if we feel physical hunger, it is so easy to go from that hunger to spiritual hunger. If we're not feeling any hunger, uh, physically or in any way, how, how can we feel this hunger or longing for the Lord? Now you might just say, well, we just will it. We just do it. But do we? Maybe in some countries, very, very poor, where people are suffering. Maybe in the Middle East, where Christians are being persecuted, where families are being taken away, kids are being um, slain right in front of the face of the parents. Maybe there they hunger for justice and for peace. They hunger for a renewal. But quite frankly, here in the United States of America, now there is poverty and all, but uh, we are pretty blessed. I mean, our lives are pretty comfortable. Uh, nobody, nobody drove here to Mass today worrying about if you were going to be ambushed and put to death. Uh, it's, please. It's safe, it's secure. Every comfort we want, we can get. Just watch television. Every commercial is designed to say this. Are you comfortable yet? Because we can make you more comfortable. Get this product. Get that one. Eat this. Drink that. Take this pill. Now, it's true. There can be some side effects. Even death occurred. But take this pill. You'll feel better. Everything is about feeling better, feel more comfortable, be content, be satisfied. So you tell me how, 
after everything that surrounds us is shouting at us, be comfortable, be And by the way, why don't you hunger and long for Jesus Christ? Really? So the church says, don't eat anything. Don't drink anything. But even the three hours, that's when I was a kid, that's wimpy. The real Marines, the real Marines of fasting were my parents and grandparents. Don't eat or drink anything after midnight. So if you went to the 12 noon mass on Sunday, that was 12 hours. 12 hours. Nothing. You can be sure when you pass a little panaderia or a taco stand or a, a whatever, a donut shop, oh, God, please. Because that hunger was real. And if you could feel that hunger, Maybe you could also feel a longing for Christ, for justice, for peace, for love, for compassion. We celebrate Memorial Day this weekend. We are in the longest war of our history, I believe. 15, 16 years. Is anybody happy about that? 15 years of fighting. And it's awful fighting. Those that don't come home, we remember today tomorrow, but how many come home with fewer limbs or can't see or can't hear anymore? How many come back physically sound but internally, spiritually, emotionally are just ransacked? And we should be experts at peace. We've, we've been celebrating the Prince of Peace coming into our world for over 2,000 years, but what we're really experts at, division and war and grabbing for more money and power throughout the world. All of us, every nation. So what do we long for? This really is the meaning of the body and blood of Christ. Do we long for God in a way that goes down to the deepest part of our spirit? Do we long for Jesus Christ and everything he taught us, everything that he said? Do we long for the spirit of God to seep its way into our hearts and shape us and form us as people of God? So once a year, we gather and we celebrate the great solemnity of the holy body and blood of Christ. Because the church wants us at least once a year as a whole church at the same time on the same weekend to experience longing. Because this should be at the center of our spiritual life all the time. A people who longs for God. Who longs for God. Today, um, we pause and take that moment to long for God. It's one of the reasons why I, um, I mean, this is a gift to be here at St. Bernard's. I, I want you to know that um, there are a lot of reasons to go to parishes. And when I was young before, when I was uh, ordained, in fact, when I was 11 years ordained, I, I got my first parish as a pastor. But we were in a strict seniority system. And people got the parish after 16 years. That's where it was at that time. But the parish that I got was very poor in South Central Los Angeles, and nobody wanted it, quite frankly. So I got it at 11 years. I was the youngest pastor in that year. But I remember hear, pe hearing people talk about the plums. The plums were very wealthy parishes, they said, or near the beach. That's a plum parish. And the opposite of that, I don't know what it is, but uh, it was like, go to Lompoc. What? Three hours away from Los Angeles, Lompoc? That was considered being put in exile. But I always said, it doesn't matter where you go. Wherever you go, there's the people of God. It, it, it doesn't matter. You'll serve the people of God. But Tim McGowan was here just before I came, six months before I came. He said to me, when the parish list came out and I saw St. Bernard's, and I knew of St. Bernard's because I knew one of my classmates was here. I knew some, some other priests al along the way, or the brother of my classmate, I should say. Um, so he says to me, Perry, you got to apply for St. Bernard's. It's a plum. It's a plum. And he wasn't saying because it had the most money. He really thought the people here and everything, the food on Sundays, everything was just wonderful to him. And that was without knowing Spanish. Yeah, half of his community he couldn't really relate to very well, but he loved it here. So I come here, and then I get this book from Bishop Wilkerson, and, and the, the light went on, and I said, oh my God, here I am at the end of my priesthood. What am I going to do for this parish? Just, just say Mass? 
This is why I've offered this retreat. I, uh, for five years, all I want, for Quitmouth, no, all I want is to be able to share Jesus Christ with this parish. And I know I do it on Sunday. I knew I do it every day, but even now I'm going way too long. I know it. But what can you do in 15 minutes with people? It's, it's impossible. So to spend a day, in my heart I say, with every single parishioner in this parish for five, six hours, to spend a day with Jesus Christ, I can't think of anything, anything that would be more meaningful than my priesthood. Nothing. Today we celebrate a longing. Do we long? And for what do we long? That's the question. And our answer becomes very important if we are opening ourselves to experiencing Christ, the fullness of Christ, and his life within us.